So it's the mid-90s, and I'm traveling to a country in Africa called Zaire, now called the Democratic Republic of Congo, to make a film about an Ebola outbreak. And I'm on my own traveling ahead of my crew because I have to set up the shoot. And I know that Zaire is a challenging country. It's chaotic and unpredictable and often dangerous and corrupt. And that's just the Kinshasa airport. So after 20 hours of grueling travel, I'm standing in line, hoping to get through customs quickly, when suddenly this big guy in a uniform comes up to me and looks me in the eye and pulls me into his office. And I know he expects me to slip him some money. But I don't want to because I'm thrifty and stubborn and I'm not ready to start greasing palms yet. So after a few minutes of questioning me, he gets bored and he sits me in a chair at the back of his airless office. And over the course of the next four hours, I watch as a parade of locals come through his office for questioning and the right answer is almost always accompanied by cash as they pay for the privilege of leaving. And finally, I just go, excuse me, I'm exhausted. I'm staying at the Intercontinental Hotel. Can I just go and check in and take a quick shower and we can continue this interview later uh, over dinner? And suddenly, he smiles and he says, tu restes à l'intel? You're staying at the Intercontinental? Sure, what time? <laughs> so. So Juambe, I learned his name later that night, shows up out of uniform and in his Sunday best. And while it might not have been the date he was hoping for, <laughs> he, he was curious about me and my life in Canada, and I was curious about his life too. And suddenly, we weren't just a corrupt African official and an easy Canadian mark. We were two human beings from different worlds sharing some stories over a meal. And we both got something out of that dinner that night. Uh, Juanbe got a glimpse into a different world, and yes, a dinner. And I learned that this was a harrowing time in Zaire. The government wasn't paying the military and other civil servants, so they used their uniforms as a license to shake people down. Sometimes in really unspeakable ways, but uh, sometimes in just your run-of-the-mill extortion. And Juanbe was just making a living the only way he knew how. That was the harsh reality in Zaire at the time. And after that one dinner, Juanbe used his influence to help smooth things over for me and my crew throughout our shoot. And when it came time to leave the country, he walked us proudly through the airport like VIPs, and I shook his hand to say a grateful goodbye, and I tried to slip him a few hundred dollars, and he refused to take it. My experience with him taught me some important life lessons about people and perceptions and about the way I choose to go about my work in documentary films. And as I've traveled around the world meeting an extraordinary variety of people and bringing their stories home with me, I've learned to ask myself three things. Who are these people really? And what are the circumstances that made them who they are? And finally, what can I show and say that can connect my audiences with these strangers in strange places? And what often surprises me is that it's not how different they are from us that makes them interesting. It's, uh, it's our similarities that draw us in. It's the commonplace, the ordinary, the things that we can relate to. And if I can get to that part of a human being, it's much more compelling than condemning them or judging them. So I'm going to talk about how I found the ordinary in some extraordinary stories. By way of introduction, my parents uh, were Holocaust survivors, and I found it too difficult to delve into their past. All my friends have told me I need therapy. Um, that's another TED Talk next year. But I do think that my parents' uh, history has influenced the direction I've taken in my work. I gravitated to investigative films, um, stories from the outer edges of society, Ebola, pornography, sex trafficking, organ trafficking. I'm drawn to stories of exploitation, disease, and death. It's a living. But, <laughs> but the temptation to sensationalize with stories like these is so strong that it takes a conscious effort on my part, and the audience, I think, to look beyond the obvious, beyond the stereotypes. So, I always try to find the regular person, the human being behind the villain or the victim. I'm sure many of you remember the TV series The Sopranos. 
Well, The Sopranos changed the way we think about the Mafia, and it did it by melding the stereotypical and the typical, and by discovering the extraordinary in the ordinary. Tony Soprano is a typical mob boss. He was amoral, cunning, barbaric, but he was also a human being enduring the tedium of domestic life and the frailties of any man lumbering into middle age. And the appeal and intrigue of The Sopranos was seeing Tony squirming through parent-teacher meetings or bickering with his wife, not setting up a mafia hit. It's those universal human qualities, what I call the ordinary, that actually make the aberrant aspect stand out even more starkly. So, Juambe's a corrupt border guard, the porn director is an amoral sleaze, the trafficker is a sociopath, the victim is poor and unwitting. Not necessarily true, but even when it is true, that's not all they are. Every villain or victim, in fact, all of us in this room, are shaped by layers of personal history. And I feel, in a way, like it's my job to get a little bit at that personal history. But before I can even do that, I have to get access to these people. And the question I'm asked most about my work is, how do you get access? Why do traffickers and criminals talk to you? And do you want to know my secret weapon? I smoke. <laughs> I'm telling you, fugitives from justice and traffickers tend to be smokers. And when you light up and break out a pack of smokes, they loosen up. In fact, you're sharing a common ritual. And while I'm kind of joking, the truth is, when you make documentaries, even though you're behind the camera, you have a real relationships with your, relationship with your subjects. You, you hang out with them and you talk to them. And People, even if they're doing questionable things, often want to tell their stories if they trust you with those stories. So, sometimes those stories actually can be told without a single word, because in film terms, you can find the ordinary in visuals as well as in people. For example, I was shooting during, Ebola, during an Ebola outbreak, and I filmed so much sickness and fear and death and amidst all the devastation, one of the most moving things I filmed was a coffin maker in a shack going about his daily business making coffins. That's it. No words. For him, business was booming. And while we might not relate to epidemiologists fighting a raging epidemic in a country we never heard of, we can all be moved by the sight of a simple coffin. So, in a way, the sensational, while you still want to see it, is merely voyeuristic, but it's the ordinary that resonates with emotional content. So, after I had my first child, and I was, I felt a thousand months pregnant with my second, uh, I, I realized that I couldn't go overseas for any length of time to make another film, so I turned to the only family-friendly choice I could think of on the North American continent, pornography obviously. So, I made a film about the mainstreaming of porn. Porn is often the first industry to adopt any new technology and profit from it, moving from film to video to CD-ROM and now the internet. So, I'm in California doing some research in a moo-moo out to here, and the first person I go to meet is John Stagliano, better known as Buttman. Does anybody want me to elaborate on his specialty? <laughs> I can't. Anyway, Buttman is actually a well-spoken guy, and we talk about the industry and where it's going, and then he says, do you want to see my work? And it um, <laughs> takes me into his home edit suite, and there are two monitors, and I'm not going to tell you what was on those monitors, but I, uh, suffice it to say, it was hard, hardcore porn. And he starts talking to me about this new video process called Film Look. In those days, as we transitioned from film to video, video had a harsh look, and this process made it look more filmic. I used it too. But film look didn't work for, well for certain camera moves, like pans or fast, vigorous action. So <laughs> it, it made the image stutter. So he's, he's trying to show me his technical trouble, and I'm not that comfortable with this hardcore porn, and I'm looking at the monitor and averting my eyes, and, and he goes, Rick, look, film look. No film look, film look, no film look. And I don't know what to say, so I finally say, you know, I had the same trouble with my Ebola film, which was true, by the way. 
And then suddenly we're comparing my Ebola pans with his porn zooms. So <laughs> I have to say, I never thought that one of the most memorable moments in my career would be talking Ebola to butt man, but, <laughs> but suddenly he's not just an X-rated flesh peddler. He's a businessman and an entrepreneur, no matter what you might think of his contentious product. And as it turns out, he fashions himself a filmmaker. Suddenly, we're cinematic colleagues. So in 2006, I made a film called Sex Slaves about the trafficking of women from former Soviet bloc countries into the global sex trade. I'm going to show you a very short clip taken with hidden camera of traffickers pricing women. Prepare yourself for subtitles. That's pretty dramatic. But in a way, it just confirms something that we already know, that traffickers treat women like merchandise. There are no surprises there. But I'm going to show you another clip that I think captures the commonplace within the sensational that I'm talking about. <laughs> She's a sex trafficker and she's worried about her daughter-in-law's reputation. In a way, this tells us more about the world of trafficking than many of the other things I had seen. Why? Because in Moldova, at the grassroots level, it's everyday people, very often women, who have become so desensitized by their desperation that they've completely lost their moral compass. And I think if we want to understand something about sex trafficking, it, it's important to understand um, the shattered social fabric of the countries where this trade is flourishing. So while it's easy to see what's amoral and abnormal about Nina, that's the name of the woman in the clip, what's normal is more telling, and in this case, I think, more chilling. The most recent film I made for HBO was called Tales, for the Organ Trade, Tales from the Organ Trade, and it was about the black market in human organs. Every 60 minutes, a human organ is sold on the black market. And while it's hard to think of uh, the black market and human organs is anything but a sensational story populated by villains and victims and a travesty of the human condition. And I actually expected to be telling a story of simple exploitation. I shot in eight countries across three ca continents over two years, and a more nuanced picture emerged. And while the black market is, by definition, bad, I found myself in a morally and ethically ambiguous world where everyday, ordinary, law-abiding citizens, desperate to live, were turning to the black market for a life-saving kidney transplant, and ordinary people living in abject poverty were driven to use their bodies as currency, where the medical establishment, helpless on account of the shortage of organs, often watched people die, and where the villains often saved lives. So, it's a bit difficult to sum up this big issue in a few pat film clips, but I'm going to try anyway. I'm going to show you four short interview clips. The fourth and final one is Dr. Zaki Shapira, who is a, one of the, allegedly, one of the most infamous black market organ transplant surgeons and doctors who spoke on film for the first time. I effectively have to decide at this point whether, you know, if I can't find a donor in this country fairly soon, I have to decide whether I'm willing to take on my soul the ethical burden of purchasing a kidney from somebody or choose to die. And that is really the choice I'm facing. Bahay, 
Ako naiintindihan ko naman kung bakit gagawin ng asawa ko. Kasi sila hindi nila naiintindihan. Kasi hindi nila napagdadaanan yung hirap. Naiiba sila sa sitwasyon at sa sitwasyon namin. Yun lang po. כשאני הייתי בבית סוהר בטורקיה, הבן שלי ככה היה מאוד מדוכא. עד שבא אליו הילדים מהכיתה ואמרו, מה אתה? אבא שלך גיבור. אני, אני בטוח שאם אותם האנשים שהם נגד או שהם מלעיזים עליי, אם הם עצמם היו צריכים השתלה, הם לא היו עושים את הכל בשביל להציל את חייהם או את חיי היקרים היקרים שלהם? הם היו עושים את זה. Dr. Zaki Shapira is a surgeon and a father, and he believes he's saving lives. And I spoke to a lot of people who said he saved their lives. And I spoke to a lot of people who said he's an immoral exploiter of the human condition. And while it was uncomfortable to think of the black market as anything but horrific, I suddenly asked myself, what would I do if my child's life depended on it? What would you do? So what's the takeaway here? What did I learn from Dinner with Juanbe and Batman and Nina and Zaki Shapira. The reality is that the darkness of the human condition and the light of the human spirit coexist in the shadows between good and bad and between the extraordinary and the ordinary. So what can I do with that? Well, for me, it's to always be open to a different ending, to be ready to question my own assumptions, to see the world as complex and messy, which we know it is, to remember that everyone has layers of personal history, and revealing those layers is more compelling than satisfying a stereotype. And finally, to look for connections and similarities instead of differences. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.